and welcome to the latest episode of Story of a Storyteller. And my guest today is the wonderful, the fabulous Margaret Gilmeny. How are you, Margaret? I'm great, Connor. Thank you so much for having me on. Not at all, not at all. I can't wait to dive into that wonderful brain of yours and find out loads about you. Um, on a side note, are you? Uh, do you always go by Margaret or are you Maggie or Margot or is, is it just always Margaret? I will tell you, honestly, everyone I know has found a nickname for me, because, but it arises organically. So it goes from Trotter. There's a story behind that one. Uh, Doc, Margie, uh, every variation on that. I'm a pirate. I'm a, oh, all sorts of stuff. So call me whatever you wish. Let's, let's stick with Margaret so for sake of Okay. Because <laughs> that's what I've written down. <laughs> no, because I asked because uh, I, I went to uh, college um, with a Margaret. And then um, we both graduated. And then years later, we ended up working in the same location. But in college and everything, I always knew her as Maggie. And then when I got to the school, we both worked in, she was Margaret, but I kept calling her Maggie. And then I accidentally changed. And now all the other teachers called her Maggie. <laughs> so, <laughs> Right, it happens, it happens. <laughs> exactly. Um, so there's loads of us to talk to. And I kind of wanted to start, I always start on in, in this show, I always start with the, um, the, the, the childhood and, and where, where people kind of originated from. And I was looking through your website and there was this lovely little um, story you'd written about how your mother always said that she would never divorce your father, but she would kill him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my first thing was scrolling down to the bottom to be like, oh God, did she? Um, and then when I saw she didn't, I thought, wow, that's, it seems like there was a lot of love in your home as a child so um, what what was childhood like for you with parents like that there was a lot of love in our home there was also a lot of strictness and anyone who reads my books will see I start off with the Davis my maiden name the Davis family handbook because there were a lot of rules <laughs> but there was a lot of love so the rules really were my mother saying you know I'm not your friend I'm your mother mm. and my job is to raise you right and whatnot but there was a lot of love I do remember my mother actually standing over my father with a frying pan at some point. And I was like, oh, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, I, lo I love my dad too. Don't do it. So there was uh, a lot of love. I would say in this context, there was also a great respect for creativity. My parents really said, you know, do what you love to do and everything's going to be okay. And they really knew that I was a creative kid from the get go. And so my mom would routinely send me outside, you know, go lay in the grass and look at the clouds or go dream or go talk to a squirrel or something nutty. So that was one of her ways of showing love to me was letting me be me. And my dad also really showed love to me by letting me be a tomboy because a lot of people wanted to, um, when I, I grew up in the sixties, have little girls be really girly. And I didn't want to be put in that box even as a little kid. So yeah, that, that's how they showed their love for me. It's interesting because I've like, I, I interact a lot with parents in my day job. I'm a teacher and, you know, I've had some myself, um, still do. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's interesting because usually I, in my own experience, um, it seems to be parents either let the child be creative and the household is a little bit loosey-goosey, we'll say, or it's very, no, you have to be a doctor or a teacher or something, you know, solid foundation, da, da, da. So you're, you're somewhere in between. You had parents who were strict and also encouraged that creativity. So where was the strictness and where was the loosey-goosey? <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting observation. Um, the strictness is, again, with the family handbook is, you know, just do it long before Nike got a hold of it. My mom should have copyrighted that for sure. Um, do it yourself. Don't ask for any help. Be independent, be strong, be brave. That's what the title of my book, Brave-ish, mm -hmm. grows out of learning to be only quote unquote brave-ish. So a lot of these things that are, I would say really strong values, but that perhaps we used in excess. So there was a lot of strictness there, a lot of expectation, you know, you, you will do your best and do everything the right way. Yeah. That being said, there really was a lot of respect for creativity. So they weren't ever, I would never say loosey goosey from my mom. My dad was like a crazy smart Dr. Seuss. So I could always count on him. If I would say dad, a giraffe walked in the room, my dad was all over that. He would have the name for the giraffe. And I mean, it, it would, he was a fantastic foil to that, even though he was 
someone who lived a pretty structured life, he really had a capacity be, to be super creative. Mm. I and I can tell because um, as I said, I was looking through your website and some of your some of your blog posts are extremely uh, interesting and very opening. Um, like as in you kind of open up your own life. I suppose when you write a memoir, that's that's how you write. I suppose <laughs> like I only write fiction, so I should know better. But um, there was one story when you mentioned your dad. I I loved because uh, it sparked some memories of um, my own childhood, where you said your dad would uh, read the part of beauty, so you could read the part of beast in that book or in that story or however. Um, so first, t- tell me a little bit about that, maybe. Tell me about why Beauty and the Beast was so important to you and what getting your dad to read with you at night was like. Mm, that was heaven for me, absolutely. Because my dad really had a great capacity to read with a lot of passion, um, was a really articulate person, but could get really into the characters and really go off on tangents. But I loved, 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 he would read to me every night uh, before I went to sleep. And it's true. I again, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as a girly girl. So he knew I didn't want to just be the princess waiting for someone to kiss me to awaken me. He knew I wanted to be the beast. So my dad would put on his best falsetto and he would be the beauty. So I could growl as a little kid in a flannel nightgown, you know, oh, I'm the beast. And I I really appreciated that. And we read a lot of books together. Uh, A couple of their favorites for me were Scuffer's The Sailor Dog, who sails around the world by himself and gets shipwrecked and, you know, travels to foreign lands. And since I was always, my mom said, someone who was born with one foot in my hometown and one foot out exploring, I, man, I loved, loved, loved that book. And my dad really was a a co-conspirator in making those books come alive. Yeah, I am. I, I, I cannot stress enough like to to uh, parents that reading with and to and something I think is underrated listening to your child read to you just for the fun of the story and just to be like oh wasn't that isn't what was it scuppers you said the dog like isn't scuppers so brave to explore and oh I, you're such a growly scary beast like all those things because you, you put emphasis on on story and and on fiction and all that kind of thing and it just really you know, it really drives it home how important reading can be. Oh, amen. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's such a joy, you know, when I'm with my nieces or nephews when they were younger. Yeah, kids can get so into stories. And that's something that I think adults can do too. But it's really fun with kids because they enter, they go down that wormhole in a second. And that's fun to be around. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's that. Uh, and then when you're the adult reading to the children, when they go down that imagination wormhole, as you say, they take you down with you. Like, uh, and it, it's, it's just a pure ride. <laughs> you know, you just, you just, you know, it's just amazing. Um, exactly. you know, that you say that, Connor, I'm sure it was a nice escape for my dad too, quite honestly. I never oh, thought yeah. of that until you said that now. Yeah. That from someone who, you know, suited up and showed up and took the train into the city and raised four kids and, you know, came home for dinner every night. And I think it was probably really nice for him to escape into 50 famous fairy tales and uh, all sorts of other crazy stuff. So I never thought of that until you said it today. So thank you. That's a, a beautiful enhancement of what that may have meant to my dad too. Oh, that's really good. That's really nice. Um, were there any other stories other than Beauty and the Beast and Scuffer that called to you or pulled you in as a kid? I also really loved a book called The Dog Who Belonged to Himself because I'm a, what I, as an adult, consider myself a very social introvert, but I am, when, when I was little, we didn't know the word introvert. So I can be a very shy person. I love to be around people, but I need to retreat. And so to see this dog who had created this perfect retreat world where, you know, I see the books behind you. He had his books on his, (laughs) thank you, his books on his shelf. And he had his galoshes so he could go on adventures you know he had his own life and I really appreciated that that there was a little dog that kind of was oh that's me Uh, I also along with a lot of people I know my age I'm 61 a lot of people I know loved Harriet the Spy it's not a children's story but Harriet was a real breakout as a little feminist icon (laughs) to little kids 
because she was doing her thing. You know, she was a reporter and she walked around with a little notebook like I did. And she wore what we called, you know, dungarees. So blue dungarees and blue jeans and tennis shoes. And I just, I love that. I loved the rescuers book uh, because there was a lot of it. These were mice who were uh, getting into scrapes and a mice would, you know, mouse would rescue the other mouse. And I thought all of that was just magical. Bernard and- Thank you. Um, what's her? No. And Miss Bianca. Miss Bianca, there we go. <laughs> right, and she had some beautiful bling. I mean, I wasn't a girly girl, but I do love jewelry. And Miss Bianca had this gorgeous little chain that she wore with a heart on it. I thought she was, oh. <laughs> I, so thank you for asking. My, 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 uh, I, Lilla, my words cannot come to me. Um, you, you'd swear I did this for a living. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love the rescuers myself, and uh, but but I first came across them as a film, as the Disney film. Oh. Uh, and I was I was at an age where I didn't know that movies could be books and books could be movies. Do you know what I mean? So, so for me, the rescuers is a movie, and I did read the book years later, and uh, they had a sequel, The Rescuers Down Under. Um, and both were just those films just they, they're just yeah so just Bernard and Miss Bianca and then there was uh Wilbur and Orville in the movies but I don't know where they oh with Charlotte Charlotte's Web you mean with the uh, Wilbur the pig no 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 there was uh, characters in the, in the rescuers movie called really? Wilbur and Orville and they were al two brothers that were albatross birds and they would fly Bernard and Miss Bianca to all their different destinations Oh, dude, I did not know about this. I, I mean, I don't want to hang up the call to go look up the book, but um, <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> thank you for filling me in. And thank you for loving that book because, right, yeah. the, that stuff is, is precious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, the, the books we read as kids never leave you. And one thing I spotted, you've mentioned two books that, and you said them both in different ways, uh, that they both kind of uh, you saw yourself in them like the dog who was introverted Harry the spy who had the, the notebook in her pocket just like yourself and then you mentioned of course the um, what was it Scupper the dog that, that liked to travel and that's something you ended up doing a lot of so do you think how can I put it what do you think came first those traits in you and you saw them in the book and they amplified it or did the traits were those traits like planted in you by the books that then do you know what I mean like what came first yes nurture versus nature here on this okay. interesting oh gosh I have been so to Harriet in this Harriet the spy I've been writing since I could hold a pencil I mean I really I had a little diary when my parents first took me to the UK when I was 10 years old I saw a lot, but I must admit the whole time I was writing, I was writing my little book that I was writing because I was, you know, that's what I did. That's what I do. Yeah. So I've always been a writer. I've always been a creative person. So I think it was more recognition of, oh, Harriet's like me. Um, in terms of travel, I wasn't traveling so much except family vacations in the station wagon. That UK trip was the, the one exception to that. So I think that definitely inspired me. Uh, the other book, 50 Famous Fairy Tales, a lot of the Alibaba type stuff. I was fascinated by these distant lands. So uh, that was a much broader, my life has been this sort of expansion from growing up where I grew up and family road trips to see the cousins to you know living around the world. And I think you're right. I think those books really did open my eyes to the magic of wow there are other places and yeah. what is it like what do people like where they live and for a writer even looking out the car window we'd pass a farm and I'd be like what is that like to live on a farm I was already populating future books I guess mm. with other people's lives yeah I, I think that's a that's one thing that's Every, every, every nearly every single person I've interviewed have said they wrote as a kid with their pen and pencil. I did the same. I, I've told you when I'm guest on other shows that like I remember writing a, a story about a rabbit. I don't know why it was a rabbit. I didn't particularly <laughs> like those animals. I don't know. Um, but I wrote them all in um, like blank sheets of paper, like printer paper, uh, and wrote them all out. And I wrote them like we'll say one, two, and then it flip it three, four. 
<laughs> and then five, six, seven, eight. But then I folded them all together and stapled them. And then, of course, the page numbers were all wrong. And I was so, so frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> and it, right? started, it started a very long and uh, difficult relationship with the publishing industry as a whole <laughs> and so I'm self-published but anyway um so like you definitely like it seems like storytelling has always been part of you um so then and I'm kind of skipping ahead but I think it makes sense with the conversation we're having what then sparked you to start writing with a view to becoming a published author as opposed to writing for yourself? Mm. Well, as you know, from reading the book, I assumed when we moved from the States to, in this case, it was Paris in 2000, I was following my husband's career and I quit my job and I just assumed, oh, this is my opportunity to write the great American novel, as we call it, and get it published. And that's something, uh, as readers will see, I managed to put off for years and years and years for a number of reasons. So I always assumed I would write a book. I always assumed I would have a book published. I just didn't do it. You know, the job of actually writing the book, yeah. which is a, is a shock to many of us. It's like, oh, oh, I see. It doesn't just write itself. So that was always actually an assumption I had. It only comes much later in my life that I actually get around to doing it. Mm. I had written as a little girl, a whole book. I, I guess looking back, it was probably just what you said, the pages one, two, three, four stapled together. And I, it was about a little girl who runs away from home to tame wild horses in the wilds of Wisconsin. Now that's the state just north of the state where I live. And once I realized a fatal plot flaw in the book that she was sleeping outside and subsisting only on apples, I was like, wait, wait, if she's sleeping outside, it must be summer. And if it's apples, it must be autumn. So I tore that book into a million pieces as uh. opposed to fixing it, right? Which now I, I hope a good editor would help me fix it. So I, I agree with you. I have a complicated relationship with because I wanted to get, get it right. And I didn't know it's hard. It's actually yeah. rather hard to write a book, <laughs> but yeah. I've always known it was. So this is really the culmination of a life's dream, but it, it was in, inevitable to me. I knew I needed to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned, uh, we'll take a step back from writing, go back to kind of your life for a second. You mentioned uh, your husband, uh, Patrick, I believe, isn't that right? Yes. So you've lived on nearly, you've lived on more continents than I've lived in cities. <laughs> so, um, which is impressive because there's not that many continents. So uh, where, t tell, tell me a little bit about that because I know it's, it's kind of, it was as a result of your husband's career, isn't that right? Right, where we've lived. Uh, but once I really got the travel bug and you know followed in my scuppers kind of footsteps, I did start traveling. I graduated from college and immediately uh, went to Europe because I just couldn't, I could not wait. I could not wait to get to Europe and just your rail pass around. So I traveled and traveled and traveled. And then my, I met my husband who's from Switzerland, but had already lived other places. And in his hotel career, it was clear that we were going to live in other countries. And I, I'll be honest, I at the time would have been happy just vacationing in different places, but that's not what our life was going to be. So yes, I ended up following him and his career uh, to live on four different continents. And I visited about 50 countries. So I've, wow. I've moved a lot. If any of your listeners ever want advice on how to move uh, seamlessly, I am available because I really do know how to move. And I, I ended up loving it. I ended up loving living inside different cultures. I still love vacationing in places, but I really got a lot from every place we lived. Yeah. So yes, that's that's thanks to my husband's career. And um, out of all the uh, places you lived, just to make it a, a narrower choice for you, where would you like? I don't want to say what's your favorite because I mean, like every every place is going to be your favorite for different reasons. You know what I mean? But where would you like to just have had a, a, just one more year there, or a little bit more time before you left? Ooh, that's a great way of putting it because you're right people ask me all the time what's my favorite and it's yeah. 
we don't have children, but you know, it's a, what's your favorite child? Oh, that's cruel. I can't answer that. Where would I like to have had one more year? I would say out of all our postings, Singapore, because by the time we got to Singapore, I knew myself better. I had really grown up and I had let go of a lot of the roles I'd taken on. I no longer put the pressure on myself to be the perfect expatriate, the perfect corporate spouse, the perfect hostess. I mean, I had done some growing up through some emotional journeying by then. So it was a fantastic posting because I could do things that I'm really passionate about, which is get involved in the arts, uh, volunteer. I love to welcome newcomers. I love to make people feel welcome if they're new to expatriate life uh, or new to a place. So that was a fantastic posting. It's also a, a city with a lot of what, something I loved in Dublin, as a matter of fact, people with a very sassy sense of humor. And you don't necessarily see it right away. And I think that's a beautiful attribute, something I really love, and also very smart. Uh, and a lot of cultural things that were fascinating and also different cultures within one tiny, tiny city state. So there's, there's a lot going on in Singapore that people probably don't see on just a fly through visit. It maybe seems a little sterile or Asia light, but I, I loved it there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize you had, did you stay in Dublin or live in Dublin? I'm going to do the Irish thing of where did you stay? <laughs> No, just went there for accompanying Patrick on a, a business trip. Oh, okay, good. I have to tell you, honestly, I know the Irish Tourist Board does a fantastic job of saying, you know, you're home. Mm. But I have visited 50 countries and I felt at home in Ireland in a different way, yeah. in a different way than I've felt probably any place. And I have some Irish blood in me, but not a lot. So it wasn't exactly that there is something very special as you know <laughs> well yeah <laughs> it's it's funny it's like uh, irish people we we hear that all the time and like to each other like if 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 uh if you were somebody that grew up in ireland or, or identified as irish like the two of us would be like oh americans or you know whatever <laughs> but, but when people say it to us we're like oh tell me more <laughs> you know <laughs> you can't get it I, I, get, I totally get that yeah yeah, yeah. I, think, I mean it's i don't want to generalize but y'all can tell a story right <laughs> yeah. am i right yeah okay i know there i'm being american again but that is there's right. some really special attributes so yeah yeah well i think that's right. the thing every every country and every culture has its strengths you know and 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 they have their flaws as well and I, we you know not to not to be all like woo, the irish are great i mean we are <laughs> but we're not um <laughs> we're, we're terrible as well um can you identify maybe in your in yourself any strengths that you took from those years you spent traveling and i don't mean like um i don't mean necessarily you know well i can pack like that i mean you know like uh, is there anything you learned from another culture that you kind of absorbed and became part of you absolutely and i do talk about that in the book because I was quite surprised when we moved overseas as someone who knew some languages, had traveled a lot, how really lonely I felt and how lost I felt and how hard it was. And I didn't yet at that age know to ask for help. Mm. So I'm balancing that with what I took away from these cultures. So we first, uh, besides Paris, which was really only for three months, but to be in Egypt for three, three and a half years, oh, wow. I really got a very different sense of the concept of inshallah, if God wills it. And it doesn't matter to me what anyone calls it. I'm not wed to the nomenclature. If it's not God, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But the whole notion that for me, I'm actually not in control of everything, which I really thought I was. I really didn't think I was. I thought I had it, I had it. And it really helped me to see, oh, maybe I want to let go of some of that. Maybe I want to surrender to some of that sense that I'm in control of everything. Uh, it's, I met some amazing, amazing people there and people who had really nothing but were incredibly hospitable. It is a place where if I compliment you on your shirt, you will actually take your shirt off your back and give it to me. And that's a whole nother level of hospitality. And since we're in the hospitality business, that was lovely. 
Uh, and in Thailand, there were a couple of really central things. One is Jai Yen Yen, keep a heart cool, cool. And while I'm a pretty cool person, I'm not a really hot headed person. That came into play a couple of times where it actually was saving the situation where there was this communal sense of you could say, keep a cool heart and people would actually cool down, which I think our world, certainly my country could use. Um, and also the sense of there's another one called my pen Rai, which means it's kind of never mind, but it it's, is it really that important to get upset about this? Oh, okay. And that is, was really a good lesson for me because I really, you know, I like to do the right thing. I am a recovering perfectionist. And so that notion of, you know what, it may not be that important. Maybe can you let that go. So I did take away a lot from the places we lived. Wow. I, I love, I love that you, you seemed to take away the, 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 the sayings and the phrases as opposed as, do you know what I mean? Cause it's, it's so, how can I put it? Um, one thing, this is a, a bit of a sidebar, but I swear I'll come back to where we are. <laughs> um, I trust you. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I grew up in a uh, Catholic house catholic household um my my both my parents are religious still are um but it didn't um it didn't gel with me like there's there's things i saw within the irish catholic church we really narrow it down that just didn't sit well and you know i remember at one point when i was very young i was like oh i'd like to be a priest and then i found out but priests aren't allowed to have children and they're not allowed to do this that, and the other i was like oh oh no uh, and then that sparked this thing of why, why, and you know, it kind of started the whole thing. So I, I would now consider myself an atheist, right? I, I, I'm just like, no, nothing, you know, there's, there's nothing after this. We are here for one good ride, and that's it. Um. So when I'm when I was writing my book, there were so many phrases and 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 um, sayings and catch not catchphrases, but so many little things that is embedded in me because I grew up in Ireland but are all very religious based. Mm. And I found it so hard to find another way to, to not say, do you know what I'm trying to say? So I do like one example is um, like, if somebody got a shock, they might say, Oh God. And I'm like, Oh <laughs> no. So then I was like, what, what do people, and I was literally there going, what do people say that, that isn't right. religious when they're surprised? Um, and it's just funny. Hey, like when you, when you don't travel, like I haven't, I, I was born in New York but I haven't traveled, like I moved, I've been here since I was four and a half, five, uh, and I've never lived in another country. So it's interesting that you took phrases, you know, cause that was something I'm trying to break out of phrases. Mm. You know what I'm trying to say? I do, I do, absolutely. And I think they, for me, more than anything express philosophies, but I know what you're saying. They're still phrases. Oh, and yeah, 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 that, that, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. And it is a different, worldview that's what I really appreciated was the worldview that I may have come into a country with I didn't didn't leave unchanged I mean it I it they changed me the places that we lived really did change how I see the world yeah so I get that so what do you say instead of oh god if you're surprised I still don't know oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's other things about like oh, there's like even uh this is a little insight for the for the people listening in my emails to you um, we had to change the time a little bit just to accommodate and that, that was fine but I said the phrase I, I typed a phrase and I remember staring at the computer going how do I how else do I say this and uh, like so I was like oh I don't want you up on high dough when you're when you're on the call yeah. <laughs> and I was like how how can I say that in English? <laughs> that was great because I learned something new I had never heard of that before so see yeah. that's what I take away from this conversation is Another philosophical saying. <laughs> exactly, exactly. For those not Irish, it, it, it generally means really stressed and panicked and highly strung. I've, I think, I don't know. I know <laughs> what open high dough means. I can, I can point to someone and say they're open high dough, but I can't, oh. you know. Okay, no, I love that. I, I appreciate that, so. Good, good, good. Uh, anyway, sorry, back to you, uh, the <laughs> guest of the episode. Um, so one thing I think is very interesting about you and your story, and uh, one of the, the kind of the main reason I wanted to get you on was that you're very passionate about helping other people find their own voice. Because 
from what I've read and from what I've looked through in your website, your blog, your book, and all that kind of thing, that, and actually I'll use your own words against you, you wrote that um, you kept deferring the dream. So you had the dream to write the great, great, next great American novel, which you said, and then you kept deferring that dream for decades by putting others' lives ahead of my own. So I, I have so many questions just for that, for that little sentence. Like, why did you put other people's lives ahead of your own? In what way, like, how did you decide, you know, what they need and want is more important than what I need and want? You know, it's like, and so, so what was that? What was your thought process there, I suppose? Mm, I would say, honestly, it wasn't a thought process. It was very much the values I was raised with, as they say, when I cite this uh, metaphorical family handbook that I received at birth. Uh, as did my brothers. And I think everyone gets a handbook. Um, you just were talking about yours in a way. Yeah. One of those was it's, it's wrong to put ourselves first. You know, I was really raised to be self-effacing, to be of service, to be, um, to be not modest, but not to be, you know, don't, don't make yourself, you're not a big not a big deal. It's more important to be kind and good and be a service and be a scout, you know, and, and I think those are all really beautiful values. Yeah. I just recognize as an adult that I was overusing them. Yeah. And when I overuse them, it's to keep myself safe. It's like I go into this outdated defense mechanism sort of position where if I go into, I like to be a compassionate person, but if I go overboard on compassion, it's no longer about the other person. I'm keeping myself safe because that's a very old story that I was raised with. And I don't think they're bad things. I wasn't told, you know, be a murderer, you know, that, that would be kind of the wrong value. So I respect those values, but I know when I have them in excess. And that's what happened is I felt so lost without what felt like without an identity when we moved overseas that I threw myself into all of those behaviors that keep me safe. So if I'm the perfect spouse, uh, expatriate, tour leader, hostess, friend, daughter, mm -hmm. sister, I'm safe. I'm safe because that's consistent with the old stories I grew up with. So it took me a long, 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 long time to see what I was doing was I was deferring my life to it put others for forward. because it kept me safe. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you just, you, you reminded me of um, that whole, that whole point you said about um, putting others before you and don't, don't think of your own important, all that kind of thing. We actually have a phrase for that in Ireland. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's, it's when you first hear it, it's a sentence and then you, it shortens and any Irish person is going to say it right away. Oh, notions and it, okay. notions. So it comes from um, you don't want to have notions about yourself. Exactly. And it's like and then and then, you, you know, you'd see somebody walking by and they might be like really dressed up and they're just going to the bank and you just kind of look at them and go, oh, they have notions. Right. And then, then it's shortened <laughs> again and it's just notions, you know. <laughs> So and it, it's considered the worst thing in the world. And it's something I, I funny, I have two very close um, Irish writer friends and uh, they've both been a guest on this show, actually. And it's something the three of us are always talking about. It's like you have to overcome the fear of having notions in order to market a podcast and market a book and all that. So is that is that something you're struggling with? Like, are you, are you struggling with putting your book out there because of that? handbook that you were given at birth yes i would say less so now i really did sort of cross my rubicon when i started to get back in touch with my own creativity and i started to see first of all it brings me joy it's who i am inherently who i am so i had been like cutting off a limb for many many years and once i started telling stories live on stage that really helped because it was hard for me to, I'm not, I'm an introvert, but I'm not a shy person. I've done a lot of presenting, so I don't have stage fright, but I did feel, mm, this is probably having notions about yourself to get up there and think people want to hear your story. Well, people love to hear stories. Yeah. 
even my stories, even my stories. And I didn't need to make it bigger. I, I believe the kind of storytelling I do are true stories, true personal stories. I believe we as humankind are hungry for that and have been since the beginning of time. So I really saw people respond to that. And I started out by telling what felt safer to me was some of my travel misadventures and those are legion. And I do love to make people laugh and that was fun. But when I started to tell things that were more intimate, I could really feel the connection with the audience. And I had people routinely approach me afterwards to say, oh, you told a story about your infertility. My sister's going through that. Or, oh, you know, my mom just went into hospice care. Thank you for sharing what you've been feeling. And that is absolutely went into my heart, the sense of making a genuine connection with people not by, I hope, overusing the story, but by being real and by being human. And I got over every qualm I had about getting up there because I could see it was, it was touching people. People were being touched by story. And that let, you know, led me onward. So that was a real turning point for me was seeing the impact that having notions uh, <laughs> was having, it was, it was actually positive. Although my mom, my celestial mom is probably like, well, don't overdo it. You know, yeah, don't yeah, overdo yeah. It. <laughs> there's a line, it's there. There's, exactly. You can, you can be on the line. You can put a toe <laughs> over it, but don't go over it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I still have those voices. Yeah. And I will say with the book at first, my old story reaction was, well, if I just sell the book to my closest friends, I'll be happy. And that's not true. That's not true. So I've had to overcome that having notion sense of, well, why do you think your book should be out there? And I wrote the book in the hopes of inspiring people to live their own lives and tell their own stories. And I believe in that. So if I'm able to put what I believe in, why, why I do something that helps me get over my sense of I'm having notions about myself. Yeah, that's uh, that's brilliant, and um, it's uh, you touched on something there. You said that uh, you know you liked telling the travel misadventures, and it made people laugh. And I think making people laugh is uh, how can I put it? It's the base level of connecting between of, of a story connecting right because because a funny story is objectively always funny you know like obviously you can tell it well and you can tell it poorly and it'll do well or whatever but beyond that is what you said you have done like share sharing the not funny stories and getting people to listen and it's quite brave really in a way because you're, you're putting yourself out there so what was that like? We'll say the first time you told a not funny story was that okay. scary? Were you anxious? Or at that point, had you kind of built up a bit of bedrock of confidence thanks to the funny stories? Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, I think what helped is I had done a whole year of improv at Second City. And Second City says, we're not trying to make you funny. We want you to have fun but we're going for real. So doing a lot of improvisation, the scenes that I found most satisfying were the scenes where I just wasn't concerned whether, with whether I was funny or not. I was trying to make a genuine connection. And then life, even in its darkest moments can be very, very funny. And that would come out in the improv. And so it was kind of my gateway. I already knew that if, as long as I was real, there's also, there's funny, there's funny, there was funny times with my parents dying. There were funny moments in the infertility. There were funny moments in, you know, I've done a lot of stupid things and there, if, as long as they're real, I do think the funny comes out naturally. So I would say the improv helped by the time I kind of sort of morphed into that because the first story I told was about being in India and going into an ancient tower and with my background, it's like, I'm going to get to the top of the tower. There's no way I'm not getting to the top of the tower. And as it turns out, this monk, this tower was filled with rabid monkeys. And so it's a very funny moment when I realize, oh, shit, excuse me, but there are fucking monkeys in here. 
So it's funny, but then the story goes on. It's like, that's the moment when I realized I can say no, I can actually be brave-ish. So it was real because something real happened but it's pretty funny when a monkey is taking a, a swipe at the person telling the story. I mean, who doesn't like a good rabid monkey story, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's not- so They develop together. There's not enough rabid monkey stories, really. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's your next book, <laughs> is The Tale of the Rabid Monkey. <laughs> done and done. Yeah, tick. <laughs> um, so you, you've uh, you mentioned improv there. Uh, like, what the, because, I, I have a small acting background as well myself, but I, I'm aware of the, again, we were saying earlier, it's like, it's a, there's different skill sets, isn't there? Like there's lots, there's, there's storytelling, but then there's writing and there's acting and there's audiobook narration <laughs> and, there, right. and there's improv. So what, uh, obviously you've been writing and creating stories even as a 10 year old girl and all the way through, what, what brought you to improv? That was very specific. Patrick and I had moved back to Chicago, as it turns out, just for two years. And that is when my mom started to get very, very, very sick. Okay. And I would drive, we live in downtown Chicago, and I grew up in the first suburb north of here. So I would drive up there, if not every day, every other day. And my mom became one of the best friends of my life. So the thought that I was losing her, I was in just this terrible sort of pre-grieving losing my mom mm. and doing the best I could to take care of her and scrambling and scrambling to take care of her and I think I really wanted to make her not die you know my control freak really wanted to make that happen and I realized I need something that is not just pre-grieving my mom so I stumbled upon I saw an advertisement actually uh, came through on my uh, feed for Second City. And I thought, oh, okay, it's just two minutes away from where we live. Okay. And I went over and I signed up on a whim just to do anything, anything that wasn't sad. And it was absolutely love at first sight. I just had such a blast. I, it's, you know, back to playing with my dad, who was the original sort of improviser in my life. Mm -hmm. I like people who can riff, you know, people who listen really, really hard and then take that and co-create something with you. So that was really a blast. And then once, and Patrick ended up joining me in a, a different class, but we did that year. And after that, there was no more improv we could take. And I thought, I've got to do something else. So I saw storytelling and I thought, okay, I'll try that. And the monkey tower was the first story I wrote. And my instructor said, you know, you do not look like the story you're telling but now i'm going to be thinking of you as indiana jones and i was like oh yeah okay i want more of that so that was a sort of a natural progression and i just kept taking more and more storytelling and jumping up on stage whenever i could and i'm lucky because i started out early enough in the storytelling scene in chicago where you could get up on stage and practice and learn from other storytellers and grow together which i loved and encourage other people to get up on stage, which I love because I want to hear everyone's voice. I don't want it to just be this click of people mm. who get to do it. I want every single person to tell their story. I feel so passionate about that. That's really, really good. And it's, it's, uh, it's admirable as well, because the fact, the fact that you're, you're, you're finding you're, you, you have this really positive experience of storytelling and what it did for you. And especially when it came at a time that you needed that catharsis, you know, with your with your mother being so ill. Um, it's it's so admirable that you are taking that and say, I want others to have this experience. This this can't mm. be just me. Um, so fair play for that. Um, just about your mother, like, um, did she ever get to see or hear this storytelling skill you developed around that time? And what does she make of it? Thanks, Connor, for asking that because Again, since I was raised by her to not have notions about myself, I really was quite nervous about getting up on stage, literally the limelight on me, uh, what my mom would think of that. But I told her kind of shyly, I was taking storytelling. And then really actually quite near the end of my mom's life, I took out the video of this monkey tower story. And I was pretty 
nervous that my mom would say, oh, that's a little bit over the line. And this is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a grown up when this story yeah. is happening, but still the little kid was still nervous about that. And she laughed at all the right places. She sighed at all the right places. And she said, she used to call me Missy. Missy, I'm just so proud of you for telling your stories. And that had a big impact on my life. First of all, to have that intimacy with my mom, to have her see something that was giving me so much joy and gave her pleasure. But it also honestly helped me to rewrite a story I'd been carrying around since I was a little girl when I had an incident where I was being really loud and dramatic and for very good reason, my mom kind of reined it in. It really, really good reason any adult would have done the same thing. Yeah. But I made that mean that I should always be small, that I should always be quiet. And that was never ever what she meant. So it was this incredible, to use your word catharsis, this feeling of, uh, okay, I got that wrong 50 years ago. And to let go of that, you know, she said something and I made it mean something else. There's a lot of freedom there. So it was wonderful to get to share that with her on many, many levels. Yeah. Oh, that's, 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 that's amazing because, uh, to, to, you know, because to, to, to have that, like, um, uh, the only word that's coming to mind and it's, I'm not comfortable with it is to have that correction of that memory. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, to, to be like, oh that's it because you know it just it um i suppose it just brought a little bit of love more love into your relationship with your mother which is uh, an amazing thing to have especially as you said it was near the end so i'm assuming that it came at the perfect time <laughs> it did it did and i honestly i would wish that for anyone for us to have the opportunity to look at huh someone said x but i made it mean y or z because i've subsequently seen many things where oh i've been carrying around that message for a long time so that obviously impacted my willingness to commit to writing a book when I realized, wait, I've been carrying around this notion that I'm supposed to put everyone before me until forever and ever, amen. I think I, I, think I got that wrong. So then uh, you started writing Bravish. Um, can you tell me what was that like? Did Bravish, was it always going to be a, a memoir or... Was it just you writing down stuff and then you said, actually, could I put these things together and turn it into something else? It was definitely not started out as a memoir. I had just written and performed a solo show, which was in fact, what I call growing up with my mom called Fierce, where I, I talked a lot about what I just explained to you and the sense of my mom was really willing to meet me halfway. And after she died, I wanted to share that growing up together with her. And again, that's a, a case of there, I think are a lot of funny moments in that solo show, but I did have someone come up to me afterwards and say, I haven't seen my mom in too long. I'm gonna go see my mom. And that's really all the satisfaction I need as an artist. I love the applause. I love to make people laugh, but when I feel I've touched someone that really, really touches me. So I thought I'm gonna write another solo show. And that was because we had a, a presidential election in 2016, which I don't even oh, like yeah. think about. And I was so, along with some portion of the population, completely despondent. Mm. And what can I do? And I thought what I can do is I'm an artist. I can write, I can share that I wanted to push back against the notion of the other is bad, which is, I felt what was being shoved down everyone's throat. And that's just not my experience. And so I started to write about some of the stuff we've already talked about today, you know, how places changed me and how people changed me and how the world changed me. And as I wrote these travelers tales, it became really clear to me, oh gosh, this is not just my travel journey. This is my emotional journey to come from someone who self-censored and put everyone else, else first to her creative, you know, sort of creative re-expression. Mm -hmm. And so then it became clear, oh, I guess I'm writing a memoir. I had no idea I was writing a memoir. And the good news is I thought, oh, wow, I should have written this sooner. Well, you can't actually write a memoir in Till you've lived 
at least a little life. So I have that going for me. <laughs> yeah. So it, it had written itself in many ways. And then it was up to me to write it down and, and put it out in the world. But it started out as a political statement and then morphed into something else. Well, that's brilliant. And uh, congrats on getting it done. Because I think um, memoir is, a, uh, how can I put it? It's a funny thing in the sense that everyone has a life, right? So every, everyone has a memoir in them, really. Yes. You know, like everyone has a story to tell. And given the right, uh, how can I put it? Given the right guidance and given the right editing and the right words, everyone's memoir could, can be amazing and an amazing read. So it, it is, it's, uh, but the thing with memoir is a lot of people start writing it and then they keep writing it and, <laughs> and they keep writing it. And then, right. well, geez, it's been three years. Uh, will I put in the last two years and then they keep writing, you know? Right. So um, congrats on finishing a memoir because that's, that's an achievement in itself, but then to publish it as well. Um, so uh, really quickly, what has publishing, what has life been like as a published author? Because it came out, um around the same time this podcast started yay yay so we have the same birthday same yeah. creative <laughs> birthday around that uh it's been a very you and i were talking about audiobooks uh before this it's a very different art i'm used to being a writer i also my professional career was in sales and marketing so i actually like sales and marketing as long as i know the why and I believe in the product and I do believe in this product, but I did not know this was such a different art. It's, it's like you as a podcaster. And then that's a very different art than getting the word out to people. So it's been humbling. I would say the good news is I have met amazing people like you. And I, I don't say that to flatter you, although I hope it does flatter you. I'm not taking it as a compliment. Or <laughs> I'm way too Irish to receive a compliment. I heard that and I just went like, who? <laughs> literally around. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, that's been a great joy is I've met some amazing people through this that I, I would never have met some of the people I've met. And that that has really, really touched me. Um, and some of the reviews from people, I mean, from my friends, I swear to God, if they don't give me five stars and a stellar write-up, they are dead to me. So I'm gonna factor them out. But the people who have reviewed the book who did not know me, and some people say, this gave me an aha moment I didn't know about letting go of things. Or um, I do, people who read the book, I do end up stopping drinking uh, rather early in the book, which has been a, a beautiful part of my life. And I'm not invested in anyone else doing that or not, but someone who said, your book has allowed me to start on that journey, something I, I want to do. I mean, that the book is touching people. I, I'm over the moon about that. So that part has been beautiful. It is overwhelming, I would say social media, which I love. But literally every day, I feel like there are a thousand things I could or should be doing or following up yeah. on. You're preaching Sound familiar to here. <laughs> I know only too well because, like, I know exactly what you mean because I, I, I'm I'm doing the same as you for my book, and at the same time, you're also trying to write new books. And as well, I thought it'd be a great idea. It would only take five minutes of my day every day to do the podcast as well. You know, so like. <laughs> right. you know, I know exactly what you mean and I, and I also get the whole thing of but at the same time when you do get through to someone and when you do get for you when you do get that someone saying this book inspired me to da, 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 and when I get the this book kept me up at night like you know it's that like yes that's what I want yes. and that's it's it's so <laughs> so satisfying and it's a million times better than just seeing two or three books sell you know it's it's right. you care more about the the people it, it affecting and touching people uh, yes, thank you for understanding because that's exactly it. I mean, we, we're artists, we do it to, I mean, I'll let you have your own artist statement, but when I make a connection, that's what that's why I do any art. So, so that's been frustration is built in here too, a lot. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, Margaret, I'm afraid. So I'm just yep. going to ask you, I have the same last few questions I ask everybody because it's always interesting okay. to give the different answers. So the first thing is when our interview is over, and we hit stop and record and we have a quick chat and everything. What's the first thing you're going to do? I am going to do my daily meditation with my husband. Lovely. Meditation together. Never heard of people doing that. Meditation together. <laughs> Excellent. Um, 
what then um is what's what's like one big goal you have and i don't mean like within the next year i mean like what's your one one big overall thing you'd love to do as a writer and as a performer as an artist maybe but that's that's like because writing and performing is very different so like what's one big thing as an just as an artist I would like to do something, try something different. I would like to stretch my creative, you know, spread my creative wings. Mm -hmm. So possibly next would be a book of essays, but on something that does not have a big complicated arc like this book has, but something, uh, the book of delights inspires me by Ross Gay and it's what delights him every day. Okay, excellent. And where can people find you if they're having an aha moment and want to read Bravish or um, uh, anything like that? Where can they find you online? Okay. Uh, shall I spell out my website address? Um, you do spell it out because it's not easy to spell. You can okay. like mine. Um, but also for anyone listening, as always, there'll be links in the comments or in the, not in the comments, the show notes. That's what they're called. Okay, well, it's www.marghelmettti.com. Life was easier as a Davis, but what, what can you do? What can you do? You've made the decision. You have to stick with it. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then my final question, Margaret, before I say good luck, is uh, what was the last book you read? Ah, I just read Journal of a Solitude by May Sarton, which is for my book club with Women and Children First, Chicago's Feminist Bookstore. Very good. Um, Margaret Gilmetti, Rhymes of Spaghetti, thank you so much for, um, <laughs> for coming on to the show. It's been great to get to talk to you and to get to know you and to hear your story. And um, thanks so much. Thank you, Connor. I can't, I can't tell you, I've, you've been just so amazing with your TLC for me as an artist and as a person. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>